Okay. Um, welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Atheists, agnostics, skeptics, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. Our church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good, because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, then you are probably in the right place. Um, and I just have a couple of announcements before our talk, so here we go. Um, next Sunday, so we do this every Sunday, so next Sunday the talk will be on the psychology of haters. Um, some people don't realize we do it every Sunday, but we do. And uh, the second Sunday of every month we have board games after church at the Ravenna Coffee House on 64th and Ravenna. Okay. Wayward. No. Uh, the Wayward coffee house. Um, then we have, and if you come to church beforehand, there'll be people going over there. Um, our planning meeting is going to be September 15th. Everyone is invited, so that's why we generate the ideas for the talks. Uh, it'll be during the church hour. And Phil Zuckerman is going to be reading from his upcoming book, What It Means to Be Moral. And he's going to be at Third Place Books. I'm um, not sure what that neighborhood is. It's like kind of up this hill from Columbia City. So if you have an idea of where Third Place Folks Raconteur Coffee Shop is in that same building. Anyway, a bunch of us are going to that, so um, you are invited. That is going to be like, I'm looking at, uh, it's on the website, and I can't tell what time and stuff it's going to be, but it's Sunday, September 15th. Um, so want everyone to know they're invited. All right, without further ado, uh, we will have um, David come up for his talk. Thank you. Let's see if I can fit everything on here. Um, I'm gonna try and manage expectations down a little bit for this talk today. Um, so, I love this book called A History of America in Ten Strikes by Eric Loomis. Um, Eric Loomis is a labor historian. Um, if you are not familiar with that concept, um, that's because uh, business has, has done a pretty good job over the past 200 years or so. There is a uh, business uh, department in most colleges. There is a business section in your newspaper. There's not a labor section. Right? Uh, that is not an accident. Um, it's because uh, people who own newspapers like to think of themselves as business people, and most people who are responsible for why books are printed, textbooks, um, they're viewing it from that lens. Um, but we are a rational place here, right? And rationally, we, if we were to be a random person born in the past, we probably wouldn't be a president or uh, a general or an industrialist, we would probably be a worker. So the rational way to view history is to view it as someone who's a worker. Um, Eric Loomis is that labor historian, like I said. Um, I'm going to perhaps stretch the YouTube capabilities that we have for our channel and say that we should put his uh, Twitter handle here. Uh, it's at Eric Loomis. Uh, he also does a series called This Day in Labor History and he does Eric Visits an American Grave, where he goes around and sees graves of people you probably haven't heard of or have, and then does a sort of labor history of them. Um, so I'm gonna try and summarize this book as best I can. It is not actually uh, a just list of 10 strikes. It's more a way to view American history from 1820s or so up to the present. Um, and his uh, principles start out with, number one, outside of the very rich, everyone is a worker. So what that means is, unless you are getting money because 
uh, you're a landlord, unless you're someone who owns a company and people work for you, you're a worker. And uh, average working conditions matter a lot to you. Um, and previously, it was not the case that that was so. Uh, when you were an artisan, you owned the uh, tools you would use to take raw materials and resources, create something, and sell it somewhere else. Or you're a farmer, you're working for yourself, right? Um, it's very different when someone else owns the stuff that you work on, you put your work into it, and you add all the labor, right? You add all the value to whatever you're making. Um, but you don't necessarily see that value back to you because they're just renting you. Um, and most American labor was not capitalist to strive with because we have the entire South, which is a slave economy. Um, but you can look at the Northeast, um, New England, as a place where that was a sort of industrial um, region. Um, and one of the first strikes he talks about is the Lowell Mill Girl strike of the 1830s to 1840s. Um, back then, they were farm girls who were single and young, and they wanted jobs in the cities because they're more interesting, and also you got paid for work. If you stayed on the farm, you were doing a lot of unpaid labor that wasn't very attractive. You could go to the city, make some money, have fun, meet people, and eventually you might become a wife or a school teacher or something else. You would work in this factory. Um, and they were used to working very hard, but under the conditions at that time, 1830s and 1840s, the average amount of hours you would work in a day was 12 to 14, right? Um, someone, some of those factories were 13 and a half hours a day. And uh, how many days a week? Six, six days a week. So uh, when they wanted to strike for better conditions, it was to get their hours down from 81 hours a week to 69, right? And that was that was a break. Um, and they were getting paid something like $2 a week, which, I mean, that's the past. How much could that be? Uh, a week's worth of rent would be about 25 cents. And uh, another uh, mill struck because they were going from uh, having their job pay that to being forced to pay it. Um, anytime there was an economic downturn, they would see a pay cut. And if they got a pay raise, it might only be because they could produce more in a mill. But in spite of this, lots of women did strike for better conditions. They did appeal to politicians. They did appeal to society at large. Um, and they were able to get some temporary gains. Uh, but then the workers, not the workers, the owners of the factories figured out that if you just employ immigrant men, no one cares about them. And so uh, they were able to bring in, uh, back then it'd be Irish and German mostly, and treat them terribly. And uh, no politicians cared, society didn't care as much about them. Um, but they are sort of the start of the labor movement in the United States. There were some successes um, in, you know, in terms of things like uh, some mines and such, but really that's kind of where it starts. Um, his next uh, principle, like viewing history, um, is a pretty important one, and it's called the slaves freed themselves. Uh, we tend to look at history like the Civil War as the Union Army swept in and uh, freed all the slaves. Uh, Abraham Lincoln wrote the Emancipation Proclamation, right? That's sort of the history that I got when I was in school. Um, but for a long, long time, enslaved people had been um, doing uh, everything from major rebellions to try to free themselves to doing things like uh, working a little less hard, right? Making sure they... Um, were uh, sabotaging little things, right? Um, they were they had agency, but there's only so much agency you can have when the government will kill you, right? Um, and so when the Civil War started, uh, enslaved people went over to the Union lines so that they could be free. And that caused generals to make a decision. What do you do with these people now? Um, and this labor action is a strike. They're taking their labor away from their enslavers. And at that time, the legal justification for uh, continuing to uh, keep the um, enslaved people on the Union side was that, well, if we're saying that they're property, not people, and these are trees in the states that have left, then we are just taking contraband, right? <laughs> and so that was the workaround to uh, ultimately leading to the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln did not want to do that. 
he was not super committed to eradicating slavery, but because the enslaved people were the ones to take that step and force a decision to be made, that allowed freedom to ultimately come to all the enslaved people. Um, as we've talked about, or at least in some of my lectures we've talked about, it didn't last entirely. Um, immediately after the Civil War, we had things like the Black Codes. Um, for a long time after that, um, we're struggling with Reconstruction, and ultimately that is, is mostly a failure. Um, the, the Southern aristocrats, aristocrats uh, won the peace. Um, but for uh, a long time uh, in that post-Civil War era, you had uh, black people that were uh, unionizing, they were organizing, and they were facing tremendous violence. Um, the, sorry. Uh, the third principle that he goes into is American uh, capitalism um, betrayed workers. <coughs> and by that we mean that um, for most of the workers that were um, around the North, the people who created the Free Soil Party, for example, or the Republican Party, um, their slogan was uh, free soil, free men, right? And they thought, okay, so we have destroyed slavery, now we're going to be free, we're gonna uh, make the railroads, right? We're going to uh, go off and everything's gonna be great now. But that wasn't what happened. Um, some of the lowest periods in terms of worker rights was following the Civil War, all the way up to uh, about 1900 or so. Um, and we were talking about how the, the low mill workers struck for a 12 hour day. That was a big win. Um, they are now striking for an eight hour day. So this starts in 1866, and one of the big things they're pushing for is to just have eight hours of work. And it's eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep, eight hours of leisure, which some of you probably think that would be nice if we got that, because a lot of us still don't have that. We have to commute to work, commute back from work, uh, we're not all getting eight hours of sleep, but that has been the dream for a while. Um, and um, one of the things that I like about Eric Loomis is that as much as his principle is that we are all workers for the most part, um, he also acknowledges that even though there's a working class, it has agency. And one of the big problems with the working class in America has been uh, internal strife and division. So for example, uh, when women are striking, they don't always get help from men who would like to be the only ones who can get jobs, right? Um, when there are immigrant minors, um, they don't always get support from the English-speaking minors, right? Um, and at this time, you had workers who said, everything would just be okay, and we'd fix everything if we just got rid of the Chinese, right? So the Chinese Exclusion Act was not just the government being racist, it was the white workers saying, we don't want to have to compete with them. Get them out of here, right? Um, it was also a, a, a big part of um, the anti-black animus was that they didn't want to have to work with or compete with black workers. Um, they could have joined the unions and been part of that, but the white working class didn't want that. They didn't want to have black people in their unions, and they also didn't want them outside being scabs. And so uh, that was a, a major part of hurting the strength of unions definitely in the latter half of the 19th century, but going on indefinitely. Um, however, uh, the biggest factor is not how much workers are united. Um, it does make it a lot easier if they're not, but the biggest factor to laborers being successful is whether or not they have friends, or at least not enemies in government. Um, so, for example, um, when, uh, okay, so, you know, Pullman, Washington, uh, it is named after a guy named George Pullman. Does anybody know who he was? Pullman Cars. Pullman Cars, that's right. Uh, he was not a very nice man. Um, <laughs> so, he forced workers to work about 16 hour days. Um, he forced them to live in his own housing that he would charge them for. And if you did not live in his housing, he would fire you. Uh, in, yeah, uh, in the panic of, uh, I believe this one was uh, 93, yeah. Um, he cut everybody's pay by 25%, but didn't cut their work. And when three union organizers came to meet with 
uh, he fired them on the spot. That led to a strike the next year. Um, and does anybody know who Eugene V. Debs is? Okay. So before he's a socialist, before he's read Karl Marx, he is just the head of a uh, rail car uh, union in Chicago, and he strikes with the Pullman cars, or he refuses to work on their cars in solidarity. Um, so we believe in free markets in America, and the way that that showed up is that President Grover Cleveland sent the Attorney General and the military to go and, and shoot the strikers. Um, and between uh, 30 and 50 people were killed, another 57 were wounded, to force them to end the strike and get back to work. Right. So there's no level of labor solidarity you can have when the government wants to kill you, and that's a very important point. Um, and so uh, as, a, as a contrast to that, um, there is a place, and I uh, apologize for the name, it's called Cripple Creek in Colorado, um, and that was a place where uh, miners um, were forced to uh, work 10 hours a day for the same amount of pay they've been getting for eight. Right? So they just, you're gonna have to work more, you're going to get paid not any less, and it's also very dangerous. It's a very dangerous job to do. Um, and when they tried to strike against the uh, companies, coal companies there, the coal companies uh, called in a private militia. Right? So they called in a private police, basically to beat them up and kill them. Right? Um, and when the coal companies appealed to the governor, the governor actually did the opposite. So this was a progressive governor, and he said, um, I'm gonna send the state militia in to just be a peacemaker, right? Um, the coal companies ignored him. They literally made the families of workers run a gauntlet and just get beat up on the way out, right? Um, and finally, the governor stopped that, and they were able to win this strike. Um, so that is a good story. When you have a friend, or at least a not enemy in government, you can do okay. Um, the end of that story, though, is that he lost re-election because the coal companies hated him so much. And the next time they struck, they struck the uh, government did send in uh, people to, to beat them up. Um, okay, so uh, the important thing about strikes like that is that it does force the government to make a choice. Because when you just look at the status quo, the abuses will continue, right? But if you have a strike, there's at least a chance that the government will uh, support you and not try to hurt you. Um, when Capitalism fails its workers, radicals can mobilize them to fight. So that's what you see from about 1900 until the early 1920s. Um, are you all familiar with the IWW, or the International Workers of the World, or the Wobblies? Um, they have a lot of uh, support around here, um, or at least a lot of history around here. Um, they do still exist. Um, and they were very good at being very radical. Um, they had a tendency to talk about violence uh, a fair bit, and some people did engage in violence. So around this time, you have a lot of uh, anarchists, especially, that are um, seeing all the violence that is being done to workers, and they're going to start trying to do it to a, back to other people. Uh, they tend not to be very good at this. They tend not to be uh, especially deadly compared with militia and police, but they're out there. Um, and um, one of the things that the IWW was good at, though, was getting attention. So when there was a strike, they would get a bunch of media there to cover it. Um, one of the most famous of these is the Bread and Roses strike uh, in Massachusetts. Um, this one was famous because there was a strike that was happening, and there was families there. And uh, they uh, had women and children, and they wouldn't let the children leave, right? So there was a famous incident where they were trying to get 150 kids out of the town because they couldn't eat to somewhere else where they could be fed. And the police wouldn't let them, and they were seen and reported beating women and children, right? Not allowing them to leave. So the IWW won this labor fight. They were able to help get wages raised. Then they left and moved on to the next thing, and the conditions came back. Um, and so they are, uh, radicals are a lot more appealing when you don't feel like you can negotiate with your bosses, when you don't feel like the government's going to listen to you. Um, yeah, and I think, so they, they were around here um, in Everett, actually, another, this is more labor violence, uh, in Everett they were on a boat trying to come to a strike and got uh, gunned down in the boat on the way in. Um, and about five to 12 died. But um, the, the reason I mentioned that is that everybody here has heard of the Boston Massacre, right? 
How many people died in the Boston Massacre? Six? Yeah, it's like five, six, six, right? Um, there are too many to count, and part of the problem I had with, with this talk was that there are so many of these labor incidents that are way above that. I mean, we're talking dozens, hundreds sometimes, and they aren't part of history because they're not, labor history is not part of like the normal discourse. Um, and so you had um, all of these attempts to change things, and you didn't really have much success. The closest that they really had at the national level was when Teddy Roosevelt was around. Uh, it was called the uh, anthracite coal strike, um, and with that, the coal companies refused to listen to Teddy Roosevelt at all, to have him come in and mediate, and because they were so rude to him, he ended up helping out the coal miners, which is not to say he was a friend of labor, he just didn't like how rude the coal companies were. Um, and so, yeah, I, it and it seems like, well, maybe if we're just more radical, we can win. Um, but if you look at what it would take uh, it's, it's just inconceivable. Um, I think I've talked about this before, but the Battle of Blair Mountain is one of the biggest uh, labor actions ever, uh, especially in terms of, of military action. Uh, 10,000 coal miners in West Virginia took up arms against the coal companies, um, and they lost, and they lost very badly. 10,000 men got their guns, got into trenches, and said, we're not going to have our police uh, get assassinated in courtrooms anymore, we're gonna have our children get kicked out of town, we're not gonna be uh, forced to lose our wages and starve, we're going to get our rights. And what the coal companies did was call in 40,000 mercenaries, uh, the state militia, and they borrowed machine guns and airplanes and they bombed them. Um, that's the Battle of Blair Mountain, that's right. Uh, I believe 1921, 22 is when it ended. Uh, there's a pretty long stretch of events that happened. Yeah, the, the, the coal companies had a private uh, security force, not the Pinkertons, but like that, who murdered a police chief in court and faced no consequences. Yeah, um, but things are really bad, things are really bad. And then they turn around starting the 1930s. And what happened good for laborers in the 1930s? Depression, that's right. But also, what did depression lead to in terms of uh, politics? Democrats. Democrats, yeah, FDR, right? FDR gets elected, swept in, huge majorities, and suddenly now, when people go on strike, they have friends. Um, and so, um, when in, see, it's 1937, in Flint, Michigan, they do a thing called the sit-down strike. So in this case, they're not going to form a picket line. They're going to sit right next to where they're working so you can't bring scabs in, right? Um, and they had uh, media there, they had people there, but the auto uh, workers, or the auto uh, companies, wanted to bring in the state militia to beat them down inside of the, the place, right? They want to just like, we'll just kill them while they're at there because they're not gonna leave. They are violating private property, therefore they deserve to die, right? That was sort of the argument. Uh, but the state governor wouldn't do it because he said it didn't align with his morals and his, his own like history. And also, FDR was in the White House by now and they weren't going to do it. Um, and so you saw a lot more of these strikes that were happening. You saw that the government was not gonna put up with any kind of labor disruption during the World Wars, right? During World War II, I mean. Um, and so they forced a lot of companies to come to the bargaining table and figure stuff out. They still weren't exactly friends to the unions, but they weren't enemies anymore. And people like, uh, you said Francis Perkins. Some, anyway, Francis Perkins was the labor secretary. Um, and you've, you've heard uh, Reagan say the scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, right? That is true when you are a car company or a coal company and Francis Perkins shows up because she actually cared about laborers and would actually make sure that they could negotiate and collectively bargain for their rights. Um, and this created uh, a level of, of power and, and respect for workers that's it's kind of insane, right? So from about 1930s, I believe like 1950s up to the 1970s, that's as good as it gets. There was not as strong hostility in the government. Um, it was just accepted that unions are going to exist, you do have to bargain with them, and workers have some say in things. Um, and 
that lasts up until 1981, and that is when uh, PATCO goes on strike. Uh, that is the Air Traffic Controllers Union, who were one of the few unions to endorse Ronald Reagan. Um, he didn't appreciate that too much, because when they went on strike, he crushed them. He crushed them, and they, they uh, lost everything. Um, they thought they were so important, and they thought that they, they did work really hard. And it's a very stressful job. If you're not good at your job, if you're not well-rested, people will die. Right? That's a very good argument to having air traffic controllers that aren't overworked and that are compensated well. Um, but they didn't have a ton of support. They didn't get support from the AFL-CIO. They lost. And that was the signal um, to uh, all the companies that wanted to um, start rolling back worker rights. Just go ahead. Um, and we've, we've seen that since then. Um, that has been the continuing trend. Um, and what we see in the Supreme Court right now is kind of a return to the period from about 1905 to the 1930s. Um, in 1905, the court case was, was Lochner versus someone. I can't remember that right now. But basically, the state had said, uh, if you work and you are making bread, you can't work more than uh, 60 hours a week Right? Uh, you can't work more than 10 hours a day. It's unhealthy. Stuff might get in the bread that might be gross. Right? Um, and there was a baker that forced people to work longer than that. So he got fined $25. He got forced, or he, he did it again. He just flaunted it, didn't pay the fine. They fined him 50 bucks and said, if you don't stop doing this, we're going to put you in jail. He appealed up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, the government has no business interfering with the contracts between uh, workers and with companies. Right? And so this, uh, this pro-business ideology did make an exception for women. Women could have worker limits that were valid because uh, they were weaker, right? They were more uh, fragile, and they should be in the homes anyway. Right? <laughs> so it is patriarchal on top of being very pro-business. Um, and uh, the, the reason that this doesn't make sense, we are all rationalists here, right? Um, and we should all agree is that you do not have, as an individual, bargaining power relative to your, your boss, right? All of the employees have bargaining power against the one boss. Um, but also, in an industry, it's pretty easy for three or four or five bosses to talk to each other, decide how much should um, we pay people, how long should we pay them, right? It's pretty easy to come to an agreement, even though that's illegal, right? Um, it's a lot harder for individuals if they're not organized to do that. Um, and it's also the case that uh, when workers go on strike, it is the only way to withdraw our labor and show that your business can't exist without us, right? For all of the genius that exists, for Jeff Bezos, he's a smart guy, sure. If he didn't have workers doing stuff, his business could not exist, right? Um, and so um, strikes, are the only way to show that relationship. Uh, they only work when you have solidarity. Um, and the other problem with strikes, as much as they are the only thing that we can do, uh, you're never, you're, your, your boss is never gonna starve. A strike is never gonna starve Jeff Bezos. He has all the money he needs for the rest of his life and a thousand lifetimes. But workers, if they don't have money, can't, uh, can't live. Um, and yet, that is the only way to force the government to make a decision whether or not to uh, go along with you. And um, we, we have a tendency to look at history through the eyes of the winners, through the eyes of um, strains that ended up um, being successful someday. So even if it failed then, you see it through. A lot of these labor movements just withered on the vine. Um, and yet I think they're really instructive because when you hear bosses now say, there is no way that we could drop um, to six hours a day, right? There's no way we could like pay somebody a living wage and also six hours a day. They've been saying that since it was $2 a week. And they've been saying it since they were forcing people to work 14 hours a day. Um, and that is the sort of, uh, I would say that is the value of a book like A History of America in 10 Strikes. It helps you to see the through lines between 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, and today. Um, and that's my talk.